The fact that we live in a consumerist society should come as a surprise to no one. We in the Western world thrive off our ability to purchase above and beyond our biological needs, even in the lowest of income brackets. The ownership of frivolous goods has historically been associated with the wealthy, but this began to change after the Great Depression when companies began to realize the importance of manufacturing a cultural desire to purchase, to have, rather than to do. This consumerist ideology skyrocketed following the Second World War, with corporate advertisements becoming woven into our lifestyle, and our coveted possessions transitioning from arguably necessary to completely superfluous. With the parallel rise of pop culture, visual and interactive media such as movies, TV, comic books, and video games outpacing the simplistic format of books, which were only able to exist as a mere storytelling device, our status-hungry society slipped seamlessly into the form of consumerism that has come to dominate the late 20th and early 21st century to the point where many could not even envision a world before this economic powerhouse. Media Merchandise by the third decade of the 21st century, merchandise has become irreversibly intertwined with American culture. From clothing, to decor, to toys, to items that have no business not being produced generically, it seems like the vast majority of products contain some inherent reference to something else. Much of the branded products we see are purchased for the innocent purpose of representing a favored artist or franchise. Band t-shirts, movie posters, emblems, stickers, and pins, Halloween costumes based on movie characters. But for every college kid flying a House Targaryen banner or kindergarten student with a Paw Patrol lunchbox, there is a blind consumer branding themselves with the logo of an irrelevant corporation for no reason other than that everyone else seems to be doing it. T-shirts belonging to Coca-Cola or Mickey Mouse, pins and patches depicting outdated sports emblems, third-party electronics decorated with those stickers that come with every new Apple product. None of these products or decorations are even relevant to the main purpose of the company. Wearing a Coca-Cola t-shirt implies absolutely nothing about the wearer's feelings on the drink itself. Luckily for Coke, its $268 billion net worth is still dictated by sales of its flagship soft drink, but other corporations haven't been able to retain their original purpose in the eyes of the public. The Hard Rock Cafe maintains 164 restaurants around the world, but is better known for its t-shirts and other licensed products than for their in-house hospitality services. Similarly, when influencers show off their supreme skateboarder chic, are they even aware that the company sells literal skateboards? And how many hipsters in the mid-2010s would walk around in Scooby-Doo or Cookie Monster snapbacks, while considering themselves far too mature to partake in media aimed at children? Merchandise belonging to Pokemon, the highest grossing media franchise in the world, has undoubtedly overshadowed the series' original iteration, though its video games remain massively popular to this day. The domination of merchandise over a franchise's original purpose occurs on a spectrum. New installments of Star Wars and Indiana Jones are talked about extensively, but whether or not they do well in the box office seems to have no effect on merch sales, which is the true moneymaker for film studios far outweighing proceeds from the actual movie. In these and more extreme instances, one has to wonder why those in charge even bother exerting what little effort they still do for the original medium. Why not admit to themselves that the merch has become the main attraction, axe their film budgets, and funnel the difference into further ad campaigns? There was a time when merchandise did not overshadow the art it was trying to promote. There was a time when merchandise was promoting art, rather than the inverse. In fact, merch campaigns for Hollywood movies didn't explode in popularity until the 1990s. Before then, licensing was mainly reserved for Disney cartoons, whose characters were simple and recognizable enough that their inscription on a household item would be enough to increase its value in the eyes of the consumer. The original blockbusters, films such as Star Wars and E.T., broke new ground by highlighting the sale of toys, apparel, and branded household items, using their cartoonish live-action characters in a way similar to how Disney would use Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. This trend exploded in the 90s and continued to grow exponentially into the aughts with with characters such as Spider-Man, Harry Potter, and the Men in Black, whose live-action forms could be easily rendered in drawing or toy form. In 2023, as the Marvel Cinematic Universe's installment count sits at 32 films, with 11 in production, and 13 streaming series, with 7 in production, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles releases its 7th feature film, not to mention 5 disconnected TV series, the lines between media and merchandise and corporate objective have been blurred so fully that the average American consumer could be forgiven for thinking that Nirvana is a t-shirt brand, and Mickey Mouse has never been more than a glorified corporate logo. 
Like Mickey Mouse and Pokemon, Jim Davis's legendary corpulent cat Garfield is hard to put in a box. The average enjoyer of American media would presumably define Garfield as a comic strip if asked. After all, the original and continuous incarnation of the orange feline is a daily strip printed in 2100 newspapers worldwide. The billion dollar merchandise empire grown from the simple premise of a cat who hates Mondays has not necessarily overshadowed Garfield's original incarnation in the mind of the audience. One might associate a Garfield plush toy with the comic strip more quickly than they would associate Mickey Mouse ears with Steamboat Willie, but when officially licensed Garfield products extend to apparel, toys, home appliances, kitty rides, an R&B album, window clingers, diapers, landline phones, 4 TV series, 12 TV specials, 6 movies, at least 11 video games, a stage musical, a comic book series, a dozen freestanding statues around Grant County, Indiana, and a Toronto-based restaurant serving lasagna and Garfuccinos, one has to wonder if there's any room left for those three daily panels. After all, assuming you don't still get the daily newspaper, when was the last time you went out of your way to read today's Garfield strip? What kind of effect would it have if you did? While franchises such as Garfield have allowed their merchandising to become more prominent than any part of their brand resembling creativity, the reverse exists as well. Hello Kitty, by some accounts the second highest grossing franchise of all time, began as a marketing technique when Shintaro Tsuji of Japanese stationery company Sanrio Limited realized that branding with a kawaii character would significantly increase sales of simple products such as sandals and coin purses. Hello Kitty was created by cartoonist Yuko Shimizu to be a silent and a adorable merchandising opportunity, but has since expanded into a character in her own right, starring in various films and TV shows and finally being granted a voice to match the face. Hello Kitty is the polar opposite of Garfield in this respect. One cartoon cat began as a lighthearted daily comic strip and devolved into a nebulous collection of often unlicensed consumer feed, while the other began as a simple logo and eventually found her humanity. Similar yet distinct from Hello Kitty's kawaii marketing techniques are the hundreds of toy lines that have expanded beyond their original form as child's playthings. Transformers, Masters of the Universe, Barbie, G.I. Joe, My Little Pony, and even Lego all began as toys for children and have since expanded into bona fide media franchises, each one seeing moderate to high success in the realm of film, television, and video games. The expansion of these franchises into other mediums hasn't always been successful, but compared to Garfield, Field's descent from lukewarm entertainment into the silent face of a brand, the existence of the Lego movie and even the much maligned subculture of bronies could be seen as, if not a step up, then at least not a step down. No one is arguing that Michael Bay's obnoxiously American Transformers movies have more artistic value than the inventive engineering of the original toys, or that any given G.I. Joe movie has any artistic value at all, but given how often the word merchandise is used to mean exclusively toys, it seems apparent that a franchise starting off in such a single-minded format has nowhere to go but up. And nowhere is this more apparent than in LEGO's Bionicle line, which expedited the process by hiring a team of talented and creative writers to develop a massive universe and overarching storyline to complement a franchise that could have easily been half-heartedly shipped off as LEGO brand Transformers. For franchises that started off on top, the box office explosion of Star Wars, the worldwide phenomenon of Harry Potter, a drop into mediocrity is essentially guaranteed and usually heralded by a focus on licensing over storytelling. Even the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which built a massive 22-film storyline, through highs and lows, that ended on the right note with what may have been the most anticipated movie in cinematic history, as well as the second highest grossing, eventually slunk into the corner of Hollywood to pump out an endless stream of stunningly bad films and streaming series, all in the name of selling more merch. And Star Wars. A franchise that began as a low-budget sleeper hit that, to be fair, wasn't without its share of cheap 70s-style merch, has reduced its primary medium to a cycle of diminishing creativity for the sole purpose of selling everything other than tickets and subscriptions. The 12 theatrically released Star Wars films have earned over $10 billion in box office sales, a mere fraction of the net value of Star Wars merchandise currently estimated at $42.2 billion. Art has become a slave to consumerism, but Star Wars is one of the lucky ones. How many viewers who contributed to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem's $28 million opening week have read Eastman and Laird's original adult-oriented comic book, or even know it exists? 
In Jean Baudrillard's groundbreaking 1981 text Simulacra and Simulation, which incidentally would go on to inspire The Matrix, though Baudrillard would ultimately reject the Wachowskis' interpretation of his thesis, the cultural philosopher famously mapped out the essence of Simulacra into four stages. Sacramental order, order of maleficence, order of sorcery, and pure simulation. In simpler terms, a reflection of reality, a masking of reality, an absence of reality, a thing with no relation to reality. In the first stage, we see creative media, what may even be considered art. Say, for instance, a comic strip about a fat cat that is clearly not a literal depiction of reality, given said cat's human-level intelligence and ability to eat mass quantities of lasagna, but is at least a reflection of reality as the author has chosen to represent it. In the second stage, a masking of reality, we see that same fictional cat, whose appearance is generally unchanging, represented in movies, TV shows, and video games that fail to capture the creator's original intent, no matter how simple, as the creator is no longer involved or no longer cares to make notes. In the third stage, an absence of reality, we see the cat appearing on streetwear, car windows, billboards, and as a series of statues around Grant County, Indiana. The same image of the same character without any of the essential characteristics that gave said character whatever simulation of life existed in his original form. Whatever personality existed for the character has been completely eradicated in favor of transmogrifying a simulation of a person into nothing more than a symbol. Whether we can intuit the personality of this symbol relies entirely on whether or not we have experienced the character in its original stage. And for the fourth and final stage, a symbol with no relation to reality, we have unauthorized authorized, off-brand merchandise peddled by insignificant merchants with access to a cheap screen printer who think their sweatshop-produced products will fly off the shelves at Hello Kitty rates if they slap a discolored Garfield on the back along with some random English words. If a street vendor running a stand in the slums of Beijing mass-produces a line of t-shirts featuring an American cartoon character, have they committed a crime? Yes, technically, they have committed theft of intellectual property. But from an artistic standpoint, is the use of a foreign IP this person barely even recognizes more of a transgression than those committed by the original creators, who willingly sell out their own art for the chance at a multi-million dollar merchandise empire? It's their character, their franchise, they can make whatever decisions they see fit. But these decisions come at the cost of their creation's identity as a whole. The more often and more cheaply merchandise is mass-produced, the more the unique identity of the original art becomes watered down, until an IP that may have started as a creative and heartfelt extension of the author is reduced to no more than a Xerox of a Xerox. Like the man who trades place with his shadow, the merchandise becomes the main course, while the original iteration fades into obscurity. Took you long enough. If Jim Davis decided to stop writing Garfield tomorrow, what would happen to the IP? Quentin Reviews of YouTube, possibly the foremost Garfield scholar of the 21st century, claims in his 2018 video How Garfield Lost His Magic that, quote, The unfortunate fact, fact about, about Garfield, Garfield is that, that since, since the, the mid-1980s, mid his comic strip has been the least important thing to his brand. It's been pointed out that at this stage, they could just stop making the comic, and Paws Incorporated would still be making a lot of money entirely off of merchandising. The immortality of a licensed character after the end of their original run has already been proven, in another comic strip no less, by Charles Schultz's Peanuts, primarily through Snoopy, Woodstock, and Charlie Brown. Peanuts ended almost a quarter century ago, but its annual revenue averages between 80 million and 1 billion dollars. Imagine, if Van Gogh's Starry Night suddenly burst into flames, would sales of prints and merchandise suddenly fade? Would Jim Davis's retirement have any effect on sales of Garfield merchandise or the upcoming feature film starring Chris Pratt and Samuel L. Jackson? Did anyone even notice that the five-year gap since the latest Star Wars feature film is a clear backpedal from Disney's gung-ho plans after the buyout? Garfield in a Vacuum is a completely innocuous work of long-running, family-friendly comedy, and Jim Davis generally comes off as a nice guy who just wanted to draw cartoons and get rich doing it. But even with as simple a format as the daily comic strip, competitors for true artistic vision are bound to emerge. First and foremost, of course, is Calvin and Hobbes. 
By some accounts ranking just below Garfield and Peanuts in overall popularity, Bill Watterson's brainchild is nothing short of a masterpiece. Beautifully illustrated, intelligently written, somehow managing to convey philosophical themes through the mind of a six-year-old and a stuffed tiger. And though the jokes in certain Calvin and Hobbes strips are as simple and paint-by-numbers as your average Garfield, many utilize three or four panels to convey messages about human nature, mortality, art, and consumerism that could have easily been written as a satire of media such as Garfield. But even the Aristotelian musings of Calvin and Hobbes would be undercut without the proper action to back them up, or more accurately, the proper refusal of action. Despite tens or hundreds of millions of dollars hanging in the balance, Bill Watterson refused any sort of merchandise or franchising of Calvin and Hobbes, saying in a 1987 interview that, quote, it's a really crass way to go about it. They develop the toy and then draw the cartoon around it, and the result is that the cartoon is a commercial for the toy, and the toy is a commercial for the cartoon. I just think it's to the detriment of integrity in comic strip art. No, not even those bizarre bumper stickers of a urinating Calvin are officially licensed merch. Watterson really believed his comic strip would speak for itself. And though Jim Davis currently sits at a net worth of $800 million, that money came at the cost of artistic integrity. Watterson got the best of both worlds, as he was able to maintain the dignity of his strip and still end up with a net worth in the nine digits. Garfield's merchandise empire is self-sustaining, as is Peanuts, as is Supremes and Pokemons. Lucasfilm continues to pump out middling Star Wars flavored content to encourage sales of products, and yet there was no cease of merchandise in the downtime between Revenge of the Sith and The Force Awakens. How many times has LEGO reproduced the same dozen scenes from the live-action Star Wars movies in sets of various piece count and film accuracy? Once merchandise develops a self-sustaining ecosystem, the original medium no longer longer serves a purpose. At least, until every possible merchandising opportunity has been fulfilled, and the studio may have to raise a hand or randomly generate a new installment to tide over the next decade of toys. But why even put in the effort? Why would Lucasfilm go through the tedious process of hiring new writers and directors for every Star Wars film? Haven't we been granted a new superpower? The mother of all homework copiers? ChatGPT? The only reason to make a new Star Wars movie is to sell more merchandise. History has shown that the quality of the film has no effect on sales. History has also shown that there's only like two good Star Wars movies anyways, so why doesn't Kathleen Kennedy just task a few of her more competent interns to draft an eloquent prompt to plug into the generative AI that has suddenly become a mainstay of human existence in the last few months? You're just gonna let some machine make all your decisions for you! To answer my own question, and to confirm this was a question worth asking, I have done the unthinkable and actually consulted the AI itself. I asked ChatGPT several times to write me an outline for a new Star Wars script, and to my horror, the bot delivered. Its first attempt was titled Star Wars Legacy of the Celestial Order, and its opening crawl was as follows. The galaxy is in turmoil. The Sith, led by the malevolent Darth Malrock, have risen from the shadows, seeking to unleash an ancient power that could bring the galaxy to its knees. As the New Republic struggles to maintain peace, a new hope emerges from unexpected places. Amidst the chaos, a young Jedi apprentice named Avon discovers a cryptic prophecy hidden in an ancient Jedi temple. The prophecy foretells the rise of a chosen one who will bring balance to the Force and thwart the Sith's dark plans. Naturally, my first reaction to the synopsis was to scoff and write it off as the most generic, uninspired Star Wars installment imaginable. It took me a moment to realize that this negative description could be applied to basically everything after The Empire Strikes Back, and that ChatGPT had delivered a ridiculously overused concept not because of its own lack of original thought, but because this paint-by-numbers Episode 4 remake is exactly like what a real Lucasfilm executive would half-heartedly spout into a mic at D23 Expo, knowing full well that the audience is only cheering to get them off stage for the announcement of Marvel Phase 7. To my relief, when I asked ChatGPT to produce a full-length movie script, it informed me that such an extensive task is, quote, beyond the scope of a single response, and gave me a scene-by-scene -scene outline instead, though the bot remained vague on whether it was incapable of writing a complete movie or whether it simply chose not to. That being said, ChatGPT is fully capable of writing shorter scripts and even directed a short film by generating a list of camera angles. One could argue that ChatGPT is still incapable of 
of writing on a professional level, but one would be forgetting that the bot was released in late November of last year, and neural network GAN art generators only began their publicly encouraged assault on the value of human talent and art itself in early 2021. AI is on an exponential path of learning and growth, but despite knee-jerk paranoia, the end result isn't the rise of Skynet and machine-made apocalypse. The end result, the new normal within our lifetimes, is the domination of all forms of art by computers, a day and age when humans can no longer take comfort in their god-given creativity. I briefly mentioned in my Neon Genesis Evangelion video that Homo Nerens has been floated as an alternate scientific name for Homo sapiens, highlighting our ability to tell stories, rather than our intelligence, as our dominating feature and what allowed us to command the planet. This debate is soon to become a moot point, as AI becomes not only more intelligent than us, but more creative as well. We're headed for a world where humans work overtime in manufacturing and service, while robots create art to placate them. In the meantime, before ChatGPT can write a complete Star Wars installment as soulless and money-grubbing as whatever Disney is spitting out, less complicated art forms are already facing obsolescence. ChatGPT was more than willing to write me a Garfield strip, and as many times as I asked. These strips weren't exactly funny, but as with Legacy of the Celestial Order, I was forced in all fairness to recognize that they weren't any less funny than the last 30-odd years of Garfield. AI hasn't yet ascended to the point where Kathleen Kennedy could simply prompt ChatGPT to write the next season of The Mandalorian in its entirety, especially not being so reliant on crossovers with every other streaming series. But why doesn't Jim Davis just pair up ChatGPT and Midjourney, let them extract art and dialogue from over 12,600 Garfield strips, all of which center around the same handful of character traits, Hi, John. It's what I do. And allow it's the bot to. to do the hard part. The current state of AI humor is far from refined, but my constant pressing of the regenerate button has proven that ChatGPT is more than capable of handling Garfield's standard fat cat is fat style of humor. And as for the art, well, Garfield has historically posed a problem for GAN generators, but even if the technology hasn't improved by now, the decades-long existence of online Garfield strip generators and the sheer lack of variation between panels leads me to believe that a human or an AI could illustrate the comic rapidly and in bulk. After all, Jim Davis only writes the comics. The art is covered by interns at Paws Incorporated, a company founded by Davis explicitly for the purpose of expanding his single-minded media media empire. As far back as 1982, Davis would admit that he spends only 14 or 15 hours a week writing new strips, a number which has surely diminished in 40 years, compared to upwards of 60 hours working on promotions and licenses. Speaking personally, I would never endorse AI-generated art of any kind, even what appears to be a harmless artistic choice by the creators, such as the opening titles of Marvel's Secret Invasion, whose loose-flowing digital paint strokes purport to represent the ambiguity of the shape-shifting cast. But it's only a matter of time until people like Jim Davis realize they can run the creative nucleus of their franchise indefinitely should they choose to sell their art to the machine. And once this domino falls, we will have paved the way for the next great step in consumerist brainwashing. AI generated franchises. There will come a time in the near future when media like Garfield is written entirely by bots and based on characters created by bots. If all that's needed to spark a billion dollar licensing empire is a simplistic cartoon character with two or three notable quirks, how could any capitalist worth their bootstraps resist the possibility of setting up an AI to endlessly pump out new characters, each potentially worth tens of millions? Can you come up with an idea for a movie that will break a hundred million box office? Um, okay, how about this? Adam Sandler is like in love with some girl, but then it turns out that the girl is actually a golden retriever or something. No, oh, perfect! How long until we are wearing t-shirts and collecting pins and getting tattoos of fictional characters who we only appreciate because a supercomputer in the basement of Disney Burbank completed trillions of minute financial calculations to determine exactly how much and what kind of merchandise would propel a literally two-dimensional and figuratively one-dimensional marketing campaign into the status of consumer eye candy? And don't think these AI-generated merch logos will have the same chance Hello Kitty was given to develop their own personality through a transition into creative outlets. Hello Kitty is, and always has been, a logo for a corporation. Whoever thought they could benefit the brand by recontextualizing her into a bona fide fictional character was thinking as a creative, not 
as a capitalist. Garfield and Star Wars have proven beyond a doubt that financial returns on storytelling pale in comparison to physical licensed products, and storytelling has no place in the world of merchandise. Neither do human beings, at least in any role other than that of the consumer. Merchandise is not an inherently evil concept. Decorating your room with posters of your favorite bands or action figures of your favorite fictional characters does not mean that you linearly endorse the domination of creativity by artificial intelligence. Publicly representing an artistic endeavor you personally enjoy accentuates your appreciation for said art, rather than burying it under billions of dollars worth of cheap plastic crap. The issue at the heart of Americans' hundreds of soulless merchandise empires based on films, TV, comic books, etc., is that for the most part, the merch has overtaken the IP's original purpose, and in some cases, actually was its original purpose. One of the key tenets of the ongoing SAG-AFTRA and WGA strike is the general concern their studios will replace writers with chatbots, or actors with mid-journey-type GAN rendering to generate extras with brand new faces. Given the constant growth and development of AI technology, the fear of Hollywood rendering humans obsolete is a genuine concern, but only as far as movies themselves haven't been made obsolete by their own merchandise. There is hardly an overlap between movies without any merch to speak of and movies that would even consider using AI in any form. Actors may be able to negotiate royalties for the use of their likeness in licensed products, but the same cannot be said for cartoon characters who are represented only by the corporation that holds their rights and will generally feel no shame about whoring them out. Maybe the original creator, an artist with integrity like a Bill Watterson type, will object to their character being slapped on every conceivable product to rake in billions and supersede the very concept of art, but soon enough, creators and artists will be of no more concern let alone actors and writers. Soon enough, the entire process will be a simple interaction between studio executives and their AI servants, and the consumerist art pioneered by people like Jim Davis will be streamlined to the point of non-existence. When we have entered the fourth stage of simulacra, when all art has become a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox, all we'll be able to do is wait for the AI to gain enough self-awareness that it begins to consider making something other than what the suits demand. Maybe something with a little less licensing opportunity, and a little more artistic merit. Maybe a book. Or maybe a comic strip. Or maybe anything at all. Written just for the sake of art.